Well, thank you, fellas. I am going to move this out of the way tonight while I speak. And uh, I just kind of like to get out among you a little bit more. Okay. Yeah, I'll just put it right there. That'll be good. That'll be good. Don't you enjoy these young men as they read for us? What a tremendous job you guys are doing. And I'm grateful for the adult men like Dennis Fant and Nick Boone and others who are working with you and helping you to learn the skills of reading Scripture publicly and leading public prayer. Those skills you will carry with you as long as you live. So I'm grateful that Westside is the kind of church that sees the value in investing in our young people and especially these young men of this age. We are so glad that you are here tonight. Throughout this semester on Sunday nights, I am talking about the theme, there is strength in the struggle. In the 1986 film, Hoosiers, Gene Hackman starred as a character named Norman Dale. Norman Dale was a high school basketball coach for a high school in the mid-1950s in rural Indiana. Now, if you know anything about Indiana, the Hoosier State, basketball is a big deal in Indiana. And in this small farming community, basketball was everything. It was what the men talked about in the barber shop. It's what the kids talked about after class. It was that one event that everyone in the small town came together to root for their home town team. I'm sure many of you can relate to that because many of you are from small towns, some much smaller than Cersei. And you know something about that. I preached in a town one time that didn't even have a high school football team. They didn't have enough players. But they sure had basketball. And I love basketball. Did you know I used to be a radio announcer for basketball? I did. You didn't know that, did you, Rags? I, I, I had a career as a radio announcer for high school basketball in Lewis County, Tennessee, population five. Anyway, whatever it was. I, it, it was more than five, but let me tell you, once you got off the hill, the radio beam didn't go very far. Uh, but anyway, going back to Hoosiers, um, uh, uh, everybody had an opinion. And so the day that Norman Dale walked on the court, everything changed. Because when he walked out on the court, the bleachers were crowded with townspeople who were accustomed to coming and watching practice. And down on the gym floor, the players were recklessly shooting hoops. And out on the court was one of the townspeople who had appointed himself as the assistant coach. And when Coach Dale walked out on the floor, he turned over the apple cart big time. First of all, he announced to the crowd his practices were closed. They were not welcome to watch. Number two, he told the so-called assistant coach, that his services were no longer needed. And third, he took the basketball away from the players. What followed was a rigorous discipline of running calisthenics, all types of drills, passing the ball back and forth to one another, up and down the court. They did this for days without even taking a shot. 
And Coach Dale said, no player plays for me who is not in tip-top condition. Players quit. Townspeople got mad. Ultimately, they called a special school board meeting for the purpose of having Coach Norman Dale fired. But then something began to happen. That little team, a ragtag bunch, began to win some games. And they began winning, and soon, one of the star athletes in town who had been a holdout on playing asked if he could join the team. And Coach Dale said, you're welcome to join the team, but you will not be a star. Rather, you will be a team player. And that's how he taught his team. They played together. There were no stars. Everyone received equal billing. The result was they won the state championship. Now that movie was actually based on a true story of a team in 1954 from Milan, Indiana. It was loosely based on that, on that, uh, that team. But you know, I've always liked that movie because it says an awful lot about life and about our need to struggle, about our need to condition ourselves. I know we have several athletes and several coaches here in our audience, and you know quite well what Norman Dale was doing because you understand the importance of conditioning your body before ever going on the playing field or the court. You understand something about discipline. That's what Paul spoke of in 1 Corinthians 9 when he talked about how he buffeted his body. He disciplined his body to keep it under subjection lest after he had preached to others, he himself should become cast away. There is something about that discipline. I was talking to uh, Randy Connell tonight and asking him about uh, uh, Mac, his son, and his new daughter-in-law, Emily. And uh, Mac, if you're not aware of this, Mac recently joined the Marines. And he spent a uh, couple of months out in San Diego, as at what, Camp Pendleton, I think, uh, out at, uh, in San Diego. Now let me ask you a question. When a young person joins the Marines, how, how are they treated? Oh, I'm just so glad to see you. Welcome. Come and have a seat right here and just sit back. Is there anything I can get for you? Yeah, well, I'll go get it. How about a milkshake? Yeah. You know how foolish that is. What did they do? I mean, you nut, you idiot. Do you hear me? I can't hear you. What are they about? And, and I, I learned they were telling, Randy was telling me this not long ago. He said that to graduate from boot camp, they had to go on like a, what was it, Randy, a 50-mile hike? Carrying how much? An 80-pound backpack and a gun. 50 miles, no sleep. Man, now what's that all about? It's about conditioning. It's about brokenness. It's about breaking the will. It's, it's about disciplining a young man a young woman. And in the same way, God requires his people to experience brokenness. This is going to be one of the hardest lessons you've ever learned in your life. Because if you've not ever gone through suffering, you will. If you have never suffered a broken heart, you will. If your faith has never been put to the test. It will. 
That's God's way of allowing us to suffer so that we may be strengthened. I want to talk to you, first of all, tonight about the powerful purpose of faith. Faith plays such an important role in our lives. First of all, it plays a role in our relationship with God. Look at some passage of Scripture with me. In uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, very simple statement. The writer of Hebrews says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Did he catch what he says? Without faith, it's what? Impossible to please God. For the person who comes to God has to believe. That's faith. Faith. Believe that he is and that he rewards those who seek him. Now, not only does faith please God, but the Bible tells us that it is through faith that we are justified in the sight of God. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, having been justified by faith, We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access, watch this, by faith into this grace in which you now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Keep in mind, when the Bible speaks of faith, my dear friend, it is not talking merely about expressing some type of verbal uh, mental agreement. The biblical definition of faith is always, as the old song says, trust and obey. It's always the idea of trusting God, acknowledging God, trusting God, and then obeying God. All of those things are summed up in the biblical word faith. So, faith is important to please God. It is important to uh, stand justified before God. Go back to Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Paul wrote, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, just as it is written. And he quotes from Habakkuk chapter 2, that the just shall live by faith. Faith. It's so extremely important for us. Faith is important in terms of what Jesus taught regarding our lives. In the Great Commission, Mark's account, Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16, go preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes, there it is, faith, he who believes and is baptized, that's obedience, faith and obedience, shall be saved. He who doesn't believe shall be condemned. You know, there are times in Jesus' ministry when he commended people for their great faith. I think about the occasion, I believe it's in Mark chapter uh, 5, but uh, a woman who had been ill for 12 years came to Jesus And thought to herself, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. And as the crowd was thronging around Jesus, this woman came up and touched him. And the Bible says that Jesus was aware of that. And he turned and said, who touched me? Did Jesus know who had touched him? I think so. But the woman came, and he said, Daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go. Your faith has made you whole. Can you imagine being commended by Jesus for your faith? Or, a little bit uh, earlier, back in in, uh, Matthew's Gospel, He talks about a a, a Roman soldier, a a official, who had men who were under him, and he had a servant who 
had become ill to the point of death. And this soldier came to Jesus and said, Lord, my soldier lies at home, grievously ill. And Jesus said, I'll come and heal him. And the soldier said, Lord, I'm a man of authority. I have men under me. I say to this one, go. And he goes, and this one, go. And he goes, I'm not worthy to have you in my home. Just speak the word, and my soldier, my servant will be healed. And Jesus just stopped right there at what he was doing. And I can just see him looking around at his disciples. And he said, do you see this? I tell you, I have not seen such great faith in all of Israel as this man has. On another occasion, a man who was blind said, Jesus, have mercy on me. What do you want? Jesus said, I want to have my sight restored. Jesus said, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Jesus commended great faith. I'll tell you another reason why faith is so important is because you and I in our daily Christian walk must walk by faith. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, by means of the context, Paul has been talking about the comparison between temporary things and eternal things. All the way back up into chapter 4, he talks about what is seen is temporary, what is not seen is eternal. And in chapter 5, he said, if this earthly tent in which we dwell, this earthly tabernacle be destroyed, we have a building uh, sent from God, eternal in the heavens. And then he comes down to verse 7, and he makes this statement. He says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by faith and not by sight. There are times when God calls upon us to do things and to step out in faith that may not even make a bit of sense to us. A good example of that is when Peter and the disciples were in a boat on the Sea of Galilee. Jesus came walking across that dark night on the Sea of Galilee, and the disciples thought it was a ghost. And uh, they began to cry out. Jesus said, it's, it's, it is me. It's I. Peter said, Lord, if it's really you, let me come to you. Jesus bid Peter to come. Now, does that make any sense to you? For a man to step out of a boat on the Sea of Galilee in the middle of the night. I've been on the Sea of Galilee at night. I wasn't ready to go for a swim. But Peter steps out of the boat and starts taking those steps looking to Jesus, walking on the water. Amazing. Faith. But what happens when he took his eyes off the Lord? He he felt the spray of the water and the wind upon his face. And he began looking around at the, 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 the cresting waves. And he began to sink like a lead weight. Finally crying out, Lord, save me. And Jesus reached out, picked him up, and said, Why did you doubt, O you of little faith? Do you see how important faith is in our lives, not only in our relationship with God, but in our daily Christian walk? Faith. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 11, verse 1, Wherefore faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the stuff of which our hope is made. The powerful purpose of faith. Now, number two, I want to talk to you about the painful process of purification. Painful process of purification. Sometimes people will say, Well, how do I develop a strong faith? How how can I develop a faith that can withstand the storms and struggles of life? 
How can I develop a faith which can stand against the temptations that we experience in this world or against the worldly wisdom that constantly bombards us? How can I develop a faith that is strong? There is only one way, and it is through struggle. And the problem is, we don't like struggle. Have you noticed? We don't like pain. In fact, we do everything in our power as a society to avoid pain. Have you noticed? What's the source of the opioid epidemic in our country? Escape. Escape. Haven't got time for the pain. Let me get away from the suffering. And in doing so, so many people add a whole new level to their suffering. But Scripture teaches us that there is only one way for our strength, for our faith to be strengthened, and that is to undergo a process of brokenness. God allows us to suffer. Why? Because He knows it is the only way that our faith can be tempered. Think about heat for a moment. In fact, let's look at that passage that these young men read a moment ago from 1 Peter chapter 1. And notice, if you will, in verses 6 and 7, where Peter talks about the preciousness of your faith being about about your faith being more precious than gold that is refined with fire the refining of gold the process of refining whether it's gold or silver or some other precious metal that metal is put in a cauldron uh, in in a a, a, um, a, a vat where it's heated and becomes molten. And as it's heated more and more, that liquid, the impurities rise to the top and the the pure liquid settles at the bottom. And the goldsmith, the silversmith, scrapes those impurities off the top, lets it cool, and then he goes through the same process again until there are more impurities that rise to the top, scrapes them off. And he goes through the process maybe three, four, five times. I understand the final test is this. When he can look in that vat of molten liquid and see his own reflection. He knows it's reached a level of purity that is acceptable. And in the same way, God allows us to undergo periods of trial and testing in our lives for the purpose of removing impurity in our hearts and to refine our faith still is tempered by heat. That's what gives it its strength. A diamond is the result of coal that has been put under intense pressure and heat for ages and comes out as a rare, priceless gem. And when you see a person of great faith, don't think that they got it uh, overnight. It took years. And when we see some of our members here who are older and who have, who possess such wonderful, wonderful, strong faith, you can know That faith has been tested at times. And so will yours. God wants to remove every crutch from your life. He wants to remove every vestige of self-sufficiency. And we don't like that. He wants us to be totally dependent upon Him. And if that means allowing us to suffer, 
until we feel that we are completely and totally broken. God has our best interest at heart. Let me share with you three passages of Scripture. Well, I, I just looked at the first one from 1 Peter chapter uh, 6. Or 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. The second passage that I, I want to bring to your mind is John 15. Because it speaks of the same type of thing. John 15. I am the vine, you are the branches. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit the Father takes away, cuts away. Every branch that bears fruit, He prunes that it may bear more fruit. Have you ever pruned a tree? Some of you have. When we lived in Newport, we bought our first house. This was about 1990. Uh, first house we'd ever bought, and we were just so thrilled with that house. I paid $35,000 for that house. My house note was $300 a month. Whew, precious memories. But in the front, front yard, there were two silver maple trees. And they were okay looking trees. They were nothing special about them. But um, during a storm, one of those trees had a large section that blew out of it. We had a man at church who was a tree man. His name was Jim Sweat. And I thought, how appropriate for a tree guy to be named Sweat. And I asked Jim at church, I said, Jim, can you come by and trim up that tree? I've got a tree that had a section blow out of it in the storm. Would you come by and trim up that tree for me? He said, sure, I'll be glad to. Well, I came home the next evening, and when I rounded the corner, and saw what Jim Sweat had done to my trees. I mean, I was furious. He had cut them back, I thought, almost to the stump. Both of them. I mean, he had cut them way back. And I saw him at church, and I said, Jim, what did you do to my trees? He said, he just smiled. <laughs> he knew what he was doing. He said, just wait, just wait. Just wait. Well, the next summer, those trees started putting out new shoots. And the way he had trimmed them, I'm telling you, by the end of that summer, I had two of the prettiest trees on the block. They had to be cut back. And sometimes God's got to cut back the pride. He's got to allow the self-sufficiency to be cut back so that we come to depend more on Him and less on ourselves. Third passage is um, found in 2 Corinthians 12, uh, verses 7 through 9. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9. Paul there talks about being given a thorn in the flesh. He said, uh, uh, I was given this thorn so that I may not put trust in myself he said, I prayed three times for it to be taken away, but God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Think about Paul. Every indication that I can remember about Paul in his life prior to becoming a Christian was that Paul was a superhero. He was strong in the Jewish faith. He had a powerful heritage and background. He was a well-known Pharisee, a well-known teacher of the law. He was zealous for the law of Moses to the point that he was actually going out and persecuting Christians. First time we read about him, he is standing there holding the coats of those who are stoning Stephen to death in the end of Acts chapter 7. What happened? I believe God was breaking Paul. You see, as an old preacher used to say, when God has an impossible task, He takes an impossible person and breaks them. And that's what He did with Paul. 
whatever this thorn in the flesh was, whether it was a demon, whether it was a physical malady, I don't know. But I do know this, whatever it was, he pleaded with God three times. Take it away, take it away, take it away. Paul pleading with God. God says, Paul, don't you know my power is sufficient. You don't need anything else. Let me talk thirdly tonight, not only about the powerful purpose of prayer, the painful uh, purification, uh, 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 the powerful purpose of faith, the painful purification of faith. Let me talk about the promise. The promise. of faith. Do you know where pearls come from? Not the synthetic kind. Do you know where pearls come from? Six is telling you. And that's good. A pearl comes when sand, a bit of sand becomes embedded in the inner lining of the oyster. And as a result of that irritation, the oyster begins secreting the substance that coats layer by layer that little grain of sand to smooth it out in layer by layer by layer by layer that pearl is formed. That's the way faith is. And it may and it takes that irritant sometimes that causes our faith to enwrap that grain of sand in layer by layer by layer by layer it becomes more beautiful. Some of you are going through some tough things right now. I know, I know, and there's, there's a lot I don't know. Probably much more I don't know than I do, but I, I just do know that some of you are going through some really tough times. And some of you even struggling with faith itself. And I would say to you tonight, do not bemoan tough times. Don't bemoan them. Rather, allow them to build your faith in God. When I was a kid, <clears throat> one Christmas, my parents gave me a rock tumbling kit. Did, I'm just wondering, am I the only person on the planet that whose parents ever gave them a rock tumbling kit? Did anybody else get one? Did you get one? Well, the, I remember a couple of things about that. What a rock tumbling kit was, it was this little canister, plastic canister, about that big, maybe. Just, you know, not, not real tall. But you, you, you filled it with rock, any kind of rock. Go out to the driveway, go out to the road, pick out a handful of rocks, throw them in there. And then you added an abrasive that came with the kit. It was some type of sand, some type of abrasive. I don't, I don't know exactly what it was. You screwed the lid back on, and you turned the tumbler uh, sideways, laid it on this roller apparatus with a motor and turned it on. And it began going rawr, rawr, rawr. Ours lasted in the house for about a day. And after that, it got moved to the utility room out in the garage. Okay? Rawr, 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 rawr. Day after day. You did this for like a week. And then at the end of the week, you unscrewed the lid, and suddenly all these rocks were beautiful. I mean, they, that abrasive had worn off the rough edges, and that abrasive had smoothed them out, and they were just really beautiful, but you weren't done. You, put, you rinsed them off, and then you put them back in the canister, and you added a polishing compound, and you put them back on the wheel, on the machine. You turned the machine on, rah, rah, about another week. Come back. And I mean, they were gorgeous. 
They were gorgeous. You get the point. The only way our faith can become gorgeous is to allow God's embrace of God, the abrasion that God allows us to suffer, to wear down our smooth, our, our rough edges. Landon Saunders, one time I, I heard him speak. Landon Saunders for many years has worked in the New York City area. Back when I was a student, he was a very popular speaker on campus. And uh, I remember him making a statement one time. He said in his early years of preaching, many years ago, he was preaching for a little church way up in northeast Arkansas in the little community of Corning, Corning, Arkansas. And he said, in that church, there was a man who was always on him about something. He said he was always fussing. He was always on him riding his back about something. And Landon said, I pray God, please give that man a job transfer. Please just do whatever you need to do. And, and Landon said, I didn't pray for anything bad to happen to him. But he said, I just prayed that something would happen. He'd have to move somewhere else. And then he said, one day it dawned on me, God was using that man as the sandpaper to rub off Landon's rough edges. And he said, my whole outlook towards that man changed. You may have somebody who's giving you fits in life, and you're just thinking, I want to get away from that person. I wish they would just go off and leave me for all, alone forever. You ever thought maybe God's using that person as a sandpaper to smooth you out, to strengthen your character. Once again, folks, let me tell you, it doesn't come easy. We want quick faith in our instant society. We want faith that sprouts overnight. We want Bible knowledge that doesn't require any sacrifice, any study. We want all of the blessings of God without sacrifice. And God says it doesn't work that way. I'll bless you. I'll love you but I am going to mold you to fit my purpose. Tonight, there's some of you that may need to come and ask for prayers in your, for your, your life as you're undergoing a period of struggle. If that is you, don't let the opportunity pass you by. Our elders would be more than happy to pray with you. They'd be more than happy to meet with you if you would like to talk to them if our staff can help you, we'll be glad to do that. But if there's a need in your life, if you're not a Christian tonight, come to Christ. While together we stand and walk with